Welcome to the Relevance Report, where we sit down with global industry leaders who are driving impact and shaping the future. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you get alerted to our next upcoming episode. Today, we're honored to welcome Laura Brady. Laura Brady is the CEO and founder of Concierge Auctions, a luxury auction house which is breaking records around the world. In only eight years, she drove the firm to a billion dollars in sales globally and placement on the Inc. Magazine's list of the fastest growing companies in America. She is a go-to source for publications such as Bloomberg, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Today Show, it goes on and on. And today she sits down with us. She's also been named by Inman News three years in a row as one of the top 100 most influential people in real estate in America. So I'm very happy and honored to welcome her to the show today and super excited to hear from her. Welcome to the show, Laura Brady. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Where where are you right now? I am in Austin, Texas at my home, my work from home office. Beautiful. Do you have anything in there that you can show me or any artifacts or things that show a little bit about you and your history, your personality? Any? Anything? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> let me see. Behind me, I have a chandelier that's from my husband's great grandmother. So I kind of like that, that it's in the background. Nice. Um, and the, the books that are on the bookshelf behind me, you can maybe see they're like in a rainbow pattern. And I don't think I can turn my whole computer around, but I might be able to. Well, I don't think I can, but the bookshelves that are in front of me are all in that same pattern. So I like my view in front of me, lots of rainbow books. And I have a statue of a longhorn steer in front of me too. I went to UT and I'm in Austin, Texas. So hook them nice. up. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Hook them horns. That's right. And, and how long have you been in Austin? I've been here for about seven years. My husband and I moved back here then to open our, what was then mostly our marketing and technology office for our business. And I had been in New York City before that, uh, when we started working with y'all also. And I went to UT though, and after graduating from Austin, I always wanted to come back to Austin. So we love it here and seven years down. Wow. And, and you've had some, some beautiful kids I've seen on your social media. You've got some, uh, you have twins, right? And, yes. and you have three, three girls. I do. I have three girls. I love following you and your kids too. Thank you. They're, we're kind of in the same world right now, you and I. Um, yeah, twin seven-year-olds. They're finishing first grade right now, girls. And then we have a four and a half year old who thinks she's a teenager already. I guess all three of them do, but she's she's a lot of little spitfire, that little one. Yeah. Amazing. Do they cheer or something? I think I saw a cheerleading competition or something adorable like that. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, I guess it's a thing all over now, but very much so in Texas, cheerleading and football. So they got into a competitive cheerleading program. This is their second year doing that. It's fun. They, Were you a cheerleader? I was. Yes. I was just, just through high school and I did all-star competitive cheerleading, but I didn't cheer in college. We, we, cheer lit in college. we literally are twinning Laura because I did national competitive cheerleading and was the captain of the cheerleaders in high school. <laughs> I didn't know that about you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Another thing we have in common of all. I know. Yeah. I know. And you know what? I grew up in Pennsylvania in a small town and and cheerleading was really big there. And um, when I came to the New York metro area, I realized it's just not a big thing everywhere. It was just, you know, something something bigger in rural America. And I had so much fun because, you know, I look for people who have done anything competitive when I'm hiring. And I've, I don't know about you, but I gained so much leadership practice through yeah. Um, working together with my teammates, you know, just like with any sport really. Right. But I think cheerleading is underrated because you do have to put yourself out there a lot. And, um, you know, it really does really challenge you to, to be a leader and work as a team and all that great stuff. Yep. That's true. Confidence is important and that, and you learn that and learn teamwork and learn to win and learn to lose, I guess, in anything competitive. That's a really good point of when you're hiring, looking at 
what people have done in sports and other activities outside of just their work resume to see what really motivates them and what drives them underneath the day to day. Yeah. I, I always ask that question. Like, did you play a team sport? Because I know a lot of people have played solo sports, which is great too, and has different strengths, but a team sport, you've really got to use, uh, you know, your assessment of others and find ways to cobble everything together to make it, uh, you know, the best for everyone. And I find that, well, especially in agency life where I am every day, I've got a lot of that where it's, it's one big cohesive team, even on the accounts, it's a team. And for you, I would think it's similar, right? Because you're, you're doing a lot of different team work all around the world, right? Absolutely. Our team, yes, is spread all around the world. So most of our operations roles are here in Austin, although now with the work from home environment, which actually has been great for us, we still have an office here in Austin, but most everyone is still working from home. And the fact now that we're able to connect with our team mates, wherever they may be in the world, has actually brought us closer together because before the pandemic, the the culture of the business was somewhat divided where half of the team was in a traveling capacity sales wise and alone, quite frankly, for a lot of their day. And then the other half of the team was here in the Austin office. And now that we're all dispersed, we all come together in the same way in Google meets and zooms like this. And it's in a fun way brought us together even more, even though physically we're more apart. So yes, it's been great. That's, that's such a positive take on it. I mean, I definitely think that as a leader like yourself, you, you, it's your responsibility to try to lead the charge, no matter what you're faced with. And you've clearly pivoted towards even greater success. I'm so impressed with the results you are achieving right now. Can you just talk to us a little bit about some of the great auctions you've had lately? Sure. Well, yes, I'm impressed with my team and what everybody's accomplished in the past year and a half um, with so many, you know, moves and turns and trying to figure out like all of us have, you're nodding, you have, everybody has tried to figure out their life and their business in this new environment. Um, But the way that the team talk about teamwork has come together really with marketing and sales working really closely together and, you know, bringing our finance and legal world to, you know, work even more closely with every teammate. It's just been really nice to see how everybody has um, gotten their hands dirty, I guess is one way to put it in this year and just figure out how to make things work. And we've had by far our most profitable year ever in 2020 um, because we were able to really both tighten expenses and be more drive more revenue um with less yeah just with less less travel less you know less expenditures in different places that have really helped us to figure out what matters right Mm -hmm. when looking at the pnl what was necessary a need to have versus a nice to have um before the pandemic and so now we really have a new um new structure of the business that we're moving forward with and back to your question of some of our recent successes um it's really played out very nicely in the sales we've been conducting we've expanded our reach now we've been in 29 different countries and this past year was pretty cool even with the pandemic to watch how many sellers were coming our way from markets all over the world, how many buyers were interested in these properties. I remember right after the lockdowns happened when it was truly worldwide, every country was locked down and I mean, to the far degree, Mm -hmm. um, we sold a property in Thailand and we had bidders from seven different countries on that one property. So experiencing while even though everyone is in their homes and can't leave, they're online and they're placing bids that are coming in from all over the place. Um, And that was really eye-opening to us and an encouragement that, hey, this, our model is actually built perfectly for this type of scenario where people can be at home, they can be browsing properties wherever they are and placing bids wherever they are. and it's, it has been really fun. 
And you've been breaking records left and right. And some of our listeners may or may not know some of the price points you work in. Uh, maybe you could talk them through a bit, you know, some of the records and some of the ranges of, of types of, of assets that you are offering up to the world. Sure. So we sell real estate assets. So we sell properties around the world and they are typically difficult to value one of a kind type of properties. So really we execute auctions in a way that's akin to auctions of fine art or antiquities, other valuable assets that are difficult to name a price for because the buyer pool is so small. Mm -hmm. So real estate is the same as any other category, whereas above any price point in different markets, there are properties that are just more difficult to liquidate, regardless also of the health of the market. So with that said, we represent properties that typically are between two and a half million US dollars and 100 million plus US dollars. We, to your point of breaking records, we recently closed on a property that we sold in Beverly Hills. Um, we worked with Hilton Highland there. We always work with a real estate agent that's local to the market. Um, and that property had previously been listed for 165 million. And we had a good lineup of very well qualified bidders bidding on that, as you can imagine. And it was a world record breaking sale, the highest price ever achieved at auction for a residence, which actually we now we we own the past four highest price residences ever sold that we know of um, around the world at auction. So we definitely are continuing to push our average price point. It keeps going up um, mm -hmm. within the past year and a half, which is great. Um, our sweet spot is really around 10 million US dollars value um, that we're really able to make a difference and help these sellers sell on their timeline. So somebody might come to you because they wanna sell quickly or an agent might come to you to say, look, I just want to add you to my sales re resources and work with you on this particular property for various reasons. And one of them that I can think of off the top of my head is you seem to be very well keyed into these global high net worth pockets of, of individuals that could be potential buyers. And, you know, being in, in real estate marketing and PR myself, I know that it's very very, very highly coveted to find those people. And that's really the name of the game. Whoever can find the, the buyer that matches the best towards, you know, to the asset wins. And I, I'm just really curious if you can share anything about how you find these people, because now you're talking about all over the world, that's multiple languages and, you know, different, you know, countries that you're dealing with different regulations and laws and, and how do you reach them? I mean, it's, it has to be so complex. What's your secret sauce there? So what you're mentioning really has become our biggest value proposition, and that is our database, the mm -hmm. contacts that we have now amassed over what is now 13 years that we've been in business with every property that we sell, we grow our database by 300 to 500 contacts. So we now have over 600,000 contacts in our database, and these are clients or agents, as you've mentioned, or other representatives of clients like financial advisors, attorneys, et cetera, that have activated with us at some point in the past. And so we've come in contact with them and we then are able to deepen our relationships by figuring out what types of properties they're looking for, serving them up with those types of properties and actually curating properties that we know are interesting to the database. So if contacts in the database are telling us they want more properties in Thailand, as an example, I just mentioned Thailand before, then we're able to actually go out and try to um, find more sellers to put on the platform to serve those up to them. Um, and it really has been fun to watch how many of these buyers that have come to us through the years will then reactivate five years later, maybe for a property that now is brought to them, to their attention. So at this point, yes, half of our bidders for every property that we sell are coming right out of our database. So it's just a matter of us reaching out to them and saying, hey, we have this now. The other half are coming through traditional forms of marketing and sales and PRS. 
efforts. So um, Relevance has been excellent for years and years at getting us in front of the right media to help tell the world about great properties that we have for sale. And we also do traditional advertising and digital advertising um, in addition to, again, really strategic reach to those folks within our database. So yes, now sellers and the agents are coming to us because they know that we have those contacts and um, many of the clients I can't mention by name because we have a lot of, um, you know, very confidential transactions, but I know you know that we've had some pretty cool uh, clients we've been interacting with and that makes this business a lot of fun too, to be able to learn from such accomplished people. Yes. You work with the best in the business. I mean, you work with the best in the business in terms of partners and you have a lot of alliances and uh, great relationships. And then a lot of the people that you work with on the client side from either the buyer or the seller are pretty amazing names, most of which can't be divulged. It's really the who's who of, you know, the, the heads of anyone, you know, successful in business and, you know, sports figures and celeb all kinds of celebrities. It's really kind of cool that you get to interface with them. Do you ever get some that want their name out there, um, you know, and, and, and are willing? I mean, I know sometimes you, you, you get one here or there, but most likely they're more private, right? Yes, they're more private. And we usually err on the side of confidentiality of the clients because we are selling the property. We're not mm -hmm. selling the client. With that being said, there are definitely times with PR, as an example, that a client's name and their involvement in the sale can definitely help to spread the word about the auction. And some of these clients are familiar with having worked in the press before, and so they understand that that dynamic will get them in front of so many more uh, potential contacts by securing certain news articles or media, etc. So as we have the PR discussion with them, they may be involved in that. Um, one that was in our early days of our business, we worked with Cher. That was one that was very, you know, publicized and she was open to that. So that's an example that she understood that by her being involved, um, it would help to expand the prospect list. So, but ultimately a property is worth what a buyer is willing to pay and buyers don't just pay higher prices because they're associated with someone who's well known, but if it helps us to get in front of the right people to build the funnel, um, then ultimately it may drive a higher price. I always thought you should have some sort of commentary in a publication ongoing. When I read all these articles about this celebrity can't sell their home. It's been listed for so long. I'm like, they need to call Laura. Like I, I think that every time they do. Like, we need, we need Laura's thoughts here on why this isn't selling and what it's going to take to make it sell. Because you really do seem to move things that might be stuck or, or it might not be right. Cause uh, that's, that's sort of a misconception that I see with auctions. I think, oh, there is just being auctioned because they're desperate to sell or it's going to be foreclosed on. Not true. It uh, might be really in high demand, but there are other reasons that they want to really, um, incite sort of a bidding war. Right. Yeah. That's, that's really what yeah. it is. There are really, yes, there are really three different categories. The first is that the property has lingered on the market and that's the one that you started with, right? It's had a hard time selling. The seller and the agent have tried everything, or maybe they've tried multiple agents and they cannot find buyers for the property. We're able to take those on and aggregate buyers and expand the market and really show the urgency of the opportunity to buy this house. So that's one category that works really well. That's the one that most people think, oh, that property is going to auction because they can't get interest in it. Um, the second is that the seller has a time that they want to liquidate or need to liquidate the property for. So they might need to reallocate the assets or the, the money that they have in that property. And so they need to monetize it and they want to get the best price that they can on their time frame. That type of property may or may not have had activity previously, but the client has that time certainty that they need. And then the far, the other end of the spectrum is the, the competitive market that is very healthy. And you mentioned that one too. Auction can help to drive price in a market where there are multiple bidders. And I give this example of when we were actually, my family, we were looking to purchase a home. Um, we made an offer on one house and we got a response that it had sold to someone else. And they just took another offer that we actually would have 
made up, we would have bid higher on that price if we were given the opportunity. And the way that real estate works, at least in the US and a lot of markets, you're not able to negotiate with more than one buyer at one time. And so auction opens that up where every buyer can get the fair chance of placing their highest bid. And when the market is really competitive, that drives most often a higher price than you would have if you were only negotiating with one person. That makes a lot of sense. I also have watched you auction a lot of islands, which is great. I mean, how does that work? How do you just find an, I guess the island finds you. How do you, how do, you, yeah. the how island do these finds, islands find you? <laughs> the islands find us. Um, the first one that we sold, I remember actually, I was with your team at an auction that we conducted in New York City. We had a live component to it. And the first um private island in the Bahamas. It was actually the largest private island in the Exuma chain. I think that was in 2012. Um, I think that that was the first auction, that, the first island that we had sold. And since then, we've sold a number of others. Um, but essentially, it's the same as any other property seller um, fits into one of those three categories, and they want to expand their reach with our database, and we're able to do that. Um, islands especially take a lot of consideration for buyers because if it's not developed yet, there's often a lot of, you know, time and effort that needs to go into infrastructure for it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do a lot of diligence work with the sellers up front to offer all of the research that we can to buyers so that they have all the information that they need. Um, and then circling back to the Bahamas, we did just sell the largest available island in the Bahamas two weeks ago. So that was an exciting one too. We definitely had a who's who of bidders on that one and have a very you know, qualified buyer that I just heard is gonna close in a couple of weeks. So that's oh, good. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank that's you. amazing. So what are some of the new things that you're working on? Can you give us any insights as to what's coming up next for concierge auctions? Well, we have we have a lot of things in the hopper that we're working on. Um, one, I guess, highest level are reach. We're working to expand our footprint into different markets that we haven't been in before. I mentioned so far we've been in 29 countries. We're looking to both have deeper penetration, meaning more units in each of those markets, and then also expand our compliance and licensure so that we can be going into even more markets. So with each property that we sell, there's typically regulations for auctioneering, real estate, business licensure um, that we spend a lot of time on making sure that we're prepped. Um, and so that's one thing, expanding our reach and just our volume of deals that we're bringing through. Um, second to that, to help to enable that, we have a lot of technology improvements that we're working on and process within our team so that we can more efficiently be bringing units through and at the same time, giving them the personal attention that each one needs. Um, so as an example, right now, our technology, when we're selling a property, we have a portal that the agent and seller can go into in real time. They mm -hmm. can see how many buyers have activated, how those buyers came to us, what advertising and exposure tactics are coming up, how many open houses there have been, et cetera. And we're looking to have even deeper intelligence to help the client stay abreast of the activity um, and also help us analyze the success of every auction through the days that it's being exposed. So it's usually four to six weeks and we have metrics now with having this historical data that tells us, you know, when things are going according to plan and when we need to add a little bit or pivot a little bit to make sure we get, we're as successful as we can be. Reach and data. Those seem to be the yes. two main points these days. Yeah. Reach and data. That's, that's very much in demand and everyone's trying to figure out how do we get better reach? How do we hone our data to get better intel and better insights so that we can move sales quicker? And I yeah. think that's, that's the name of the game and you're clearly mastering it and that's why you're doing so well. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that it's, it's also about the relationship side too. I think, you know, you can tend to think it's all about the numbers and metrics and I, you, why not automate real estate? People have said that, but you've also shown the, the counterpoint to that, which is that the relationships also simultaneously really matter. Mm -hmm. Your, your relationships are what gives you the credibility and the repeat customer experience, you know? So it is about that customer relationship, the customer journey, the customer experience. And, 
it's really important too, right? Absolutely. And in fact, when you were saying data, I had mentioned the the data behind buyer statistics when we're looking at the success of an auction, but then the data, of course, on the people that are in our database, but it's the data to help drive the relationship, right? So how can we get better data to better serve the clients the way that they wanna be served when they want to be served? And so that at the end of the day is all about personal relationship. It's one-on-one relationship with our sales and marketing team or brand relationship. So we need to think about our brand in a way that it has a personality, it has an integrity that it needs to uphold and every interaction that anybody on our team has with clients or any advertising that we put out has with clients needs to you know, hold the standard that the, that the brand does. So we, we think about that a lot too. Um, so definitely it's, this is a relationship business. Real estate is always a relationship business. It's a personal, um, very personal purchase, even if it's investment, um, there's a personal touch when you're buying such a significant asset like this. Um, so we focus, we focus a lot on that and our, our client services team and our sales team's relationships. No question about it. You can't get this far in real estate without amazing relationships. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I always tell people on my team. I'm like, look, it's, it's a very small world, real estate, especially very, very small world. And your reputation is everything and you have to be integrous and, you know, really do what you say you're going to do. And, uh, you know, these are, these are basic tips that I've learned over the years, and I'm sure you have many more. Do you have some insights for people maybe who want to do what you do one day or, you know, are thinking about a career in real estate? Well, um, let's see a career in real estate. It all, I'm coming back to relationships. It always starts with relationships and figuring out how you can build your own brand um, and align yourself with brands and other partners that are, you know, the type of ilk that you want to portray with your brand. Um, Another thing, though, that I'm thinking of as I say relationships, there, I'm going to bring it back a little bit to the, the brand standards, the client having a relationship with your brand, but delivering them the information when they want it, how they want it. So as an example, we actually just had a sale this morning in Spain and we let bidders get on the phone with someone back to personal relationship if they want to, as they're placing their bid Mm -hmm. or they can just place their bids through the technology because today a lot of clients don't want as much interaction personally. So Mm -hmm. thinking as you're building your business, how can you serve up the information that the clients want when they want it and thinking about yourself as a consumer, I think figuring out success in business is as much about considering putting yourself in their shoes or thinking about how you would want things. Like for me, if I were searching for a home right now, I more want to just get an MLS feed from the agent every morning. I don't as much need to talk to them as often, or I'd like for them to ask me, you know, do you want me to call you every day? That kind of thing. And so figuring out how the client experience helps to drive your success I think is always in any business, the most important. Um, As it relates to real estate also though, knowledge is power. Um, It helps instill confidence in you. So especially if you're starting as an agent or some other area Mm -hmm. of, of real estate, know the properties that are on the market, know the prices that they've sold for, you know, research, um, look at the MLS, like it's your study book. And so that when clients ask you a question, you can speak with authority and feel confident that, you know, the right answer for them, um, spend every extra minute that you have doing that. And that's super helpful. What drives you these days? You've accomplished so much already. And, and I know you always are, are eyeing growth and new opportunities, but can you tell us a little about what motivates you? Well, um, let's see. I mean, relationships and experiences with everybody I work around drive me. Um, we have a fabulous team. I love everyone I work with. I love all of our partners like you that we get to interact with. And so choosing those relationships wisely is really important to me so that I enjoy 
my time. Um, it's not just work. It's also, you know, personal interaction that I enjoy with other people. Um, but I think inherently for me, I've always been very competitive in everything that I do in life. And so even though I'm not just like in it to win it, but I do enjoy, um, you know, celebrating success and sure. figuring out how to solve puzzles. Business is, it's, it's a game, right? The, you know, it's a, it's a big game of figuring out how to move different chess parts um, and take care of your clients, and at the same time, you know, reach um, reach the end of the finish line the way that you set the expectations with the client that you would. So for me, I'm inherently competitive, um, and I also just enjoy new experiences. So I like getting my hands dirty and. Um, the entrepreneurial side of business. I really love. Yeah. And you work really hard too. Let's not forget that you work. Yeah, that, really that, hard that is true. That's there's, there's no substitute for hard work and, you know, rolling up your sleeves and getting things done. And, um, I do, I always have, I'm not real sure where that ethic comes from other than just <laughs> being instilled in me when I was growing up, my parents were always really hardworking. And, um, I saw that hopefully my kids see that and me too, and understand that that's important. It comes back to that drive to win and be a part of a winning team, right? You you like to be competitive, but at this point in your career, it's not just about you winning. It's about your whole team winning, the whole brand winning, the client winning. It's yep. how do we create a win, 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 win. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yes. On Friday, we're having a celebration of Q1. So we're doing a virtual celebration with our team and, you know, remembering to pause also and celebrate when you do win, um, also to pause and talk about when you don't and learn from the, you know, I don't want to say mistakes, learn from, you know, to grow from the things that maybe didn't go the way you expected them to go. <laughs> um, and help we've them all had those. Too. Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, nobody is perfect and, um, we all make mistakes and we all can do things differently next time. And so taking time, to pause and reflect um, is important on both sides. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one thing I love about you, Laura, and, and the whole concierge auctions team is you do really take time to think about what you do and why you do it. And I know that you've explored a lot of giving back throughout the years, not only personally, but uh, through concierge. And, and I, I'd love for you to tell the listeners a little bit about how you've made a difference around uh, giving back. I'd love to. Yes, we've done a number of things through the years and the most impactful of which is a program that we instilled three years ago called our Key for Key giving program. And so Key for Key is a little bit of a spin off of the one for one that Tom's Shoes does where for every pair of shoes they sell, they give a, a pair to someone in need. And for us, for every home we sell, we give a home to someone in need. So we partnered with Give Back Homes, um, which actually was founded by two um, owners who had been at Tom's Shoes in the early days, Caroline Pinnell and Blake Andrews. Oh. And they, yeah, and they have an initiative at Give Back Homes to instill more social giving into the real estate industry. So they work with a lot of real estate related professionals. And so we partner with them to help us to build homes. Right now we're building in South America and in El Salvador and Nicaragua, we've now contributed to fund over 200 homes at this point. We may even be pushing 300. Um, so that is really great for our company um, as a culture also builder and bringing us together to understand that when we sell a property for our client that we've been hired to sell on behalf of, um, it goes farther than that in you know helping a family at the other end of the spectrum that doesn't even have a home. Um, and so pre-pandemic, actually, we would take trips down to El Salvador and Nicaragua with our team, 10 or 15 people at a time, typically once a quarter so that everybody can be involved in the construction. We haven't been able to do that over the past year, but we are doing different um, FaceTime calls with the teams that are down there that are building um, with Techo Homes. That's the company that 
that we work with is called Techo. So anyway, we're able to really affect a lot of lives through that. And it's been, it's been really heartwarming and, and cool to see that happen through the years. So cool. We're doing a lot more with helping our clients in general find their deeper purpose. We, we started something called the Purpose Method at Relevance International, and we didn't need to do it with you because you already had your purpose uh, before we even created the exercise. But I'm trying to get some clients that haven't really thought about purpose to rethink it because, and I think you're a great testament to this, and, and maybe you can talk to us about it. I, I do feel like there's a different, uh, level achieved by businesses that have this extra layer of giving back in baked into their business. And, and by that, I don't mean just a one-off charity gala or a, you know, a, a small little, uh, volunteer day that is great too. But when you actually bake giving back into the ethos of the business, like you have, it's a whole other transformational level. I mean, can you tell us about the difference between concierge before you started doing this and after, and, you know, maybe compare and contrast what it's, what it's done for you kind of at the employee level, as well as just personally for you and, and, you know, how, how it's changed, changed the way you view your business. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, what you said is so right. It's now our key for key program is really part of our DNA and it's consistent and everyone knows that this is happening, you know, alongside our business all day, every day. And in prior years, we would give to certain galas and we would have, you know, sometimes at events, we would raise money for different local charities where we were selling the properties. And that was all, that was all fabulous. Love that. Um, it just was not as much of a firm foundation for, mm -hmm. um, consistency within the business. And also we do get asked, you know, pretty often to contribute to different, um, charities. And we still do that, you know, every once in a while, but we know what our true North is with our key for key program. And we have already set, you know, the standard of that contribution happening with every revenue intake that we have. So it also is easier from a business perspective for us to track and plan for those contributions. Sure. Sometimes the galas and other requests come ad hoc and it can be very difficult to budget for that type of um, contribution. And so for us, really, we think of it as an operating expense portion of our PL, and it just is something that we know that we're committed to. Um, and as far as <clears throat> permeating through the culture, um, yes, we consistently have people who come to us when we're recruiting and they're looking at a position with our firm and they've become familiar with us doing this key for key program. And um, definitely there's more of a desire for people in the workforce to have involvement of some sort from their company into some type of giving back. Mm -hmm. um, and so this has helped us in that regard too. It's, it's fun when someone comes forward and, and they enjoy that what they're doing. They're coming to us for that as well as our core business. Great. Well, once again, you're leading the charge. Once again, you know, I can't think of too many other companies that are being this progressive around the way they're incorporating purpose into their work where it is a, a one for one. I mean, that's, that's a very strong, uh, give back and, and incredible. And another thing I just want to talk about briefly is you as a female CEO, uh, a, a leader and a woman, and, you know, this has been a year of a lot of change. This has been a year of let's do some self-assessment and evaluation and look at opportunities for people. Let's look at um, you know, how we can lift each other up. There's, there's just been a lot of reflection and, you know, I really do think that, um, you know, you're, you're a great example of a female who is also helping to champion other females. Um, I've noticed that. And I also noticed that you are also being championed by females yourself, like Barbara Corkins on your advisory board, for example. So how, how have you built this sort of circle of, of sub women supporting women and, and uh, how important do you think that is in getting you to where you've gotten today? Mm -hmm. Well, it's very important. And I think that though, for me, a lot of it's just 
been created organically because I am a woman and I have gravitated to other women like Barbara for, you know, advice and feeling um, like I can learn from other women in the industry. So that's how I was earlier in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I've certainly learned and gravitated towards a lot of men that I've learned from too. So, I mean, I, I I don't want to limit that at all. My business partner um, is a male and he and I, you know, have learned a lot together through the years too from everyone around us. Um, but with that said, as yes, as I've grown my career, I have looked into, um, you know, other women in our company. We have a lot of women throughout the business. We have, um, you know, good gender diversity and have always um, in leadership roles too. And I think that comes from, you know, me, helping also maybe that others can see that I am in the role um, and leading the business, you know, as a female. So, yeah. so it makes me feel comfortable coming forward. Um, and I, I've, I've been involved in different mentorship programs with women. So it, I think it's just all about, yeah, leading um, by example and, you know, showing by example um, what's possible. I actually did not grow up thinking that I was at any detriment to my brothers and my mom um, was always an entrepreneur herself and had a lot of side hustles. And I saw that always going on. So learned from her and her two sisters and my grandmother. So I always had kind of that um, leadership and vision around me of females mm. um, in business. And so I understand the importance of that and am happy to, you know, help with that for anyone who has not grown up with that type of experience. So, so important. So you grew up with strong female figures in your life. And, I, you know, I, I'm reflecting on myself too. So have I, uh, you know, my grandmother's our matriarch and, you know, my, my mom's also always worked and been a strong female. So, and, and yet I also know very successful female uh, leaders who have not had that but then they found either a male or female other mentor that has inspired them and, and really had that same place to help get them, um, you know, so give, give them someone to emulate or, or, or sort of get advice from. And I just think that's so important, whether it's male or female, just to have someone who inspires you and shows you how it's done. Yeah. And you just never know. I mean, you're a mom, I'm a mom. And whether you're a mom or dad, I mean, at the end of the day, at, at this phase in our career, I feel like we're starting to be on the backside of that where it's like, okay, now I need to realize little eyes are upon us, right? Like whether it's our kids or our staff, they're, they're being inspired every day by the smallest little things that you might say or do. And that's a responsibility that we have as leaders, right? So uh, I, I think that's something to just keep talking about and, and keeping in the forefront of our mind as as we lead the charge in our companies going forward and, and think through, you know, how can we make it better for them so that when your girls are, are your age, right. How's the world going to be better. Yeah. And, and, and they won't even need to have this conversation. So, you know, that's, okay. yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. one of the quotes I often think of is it's so much more is caught than taught. Right. So it's basically, you know, leading by example and around your kids, you know, putting down what you want them to pick up, you know, in the way that you're acting and same thing in business. Um, and so it's important that also you immerse yourself in experiences that you want to catch what other people are putting down. In other words, surround yourself with people and experiences that are going to better you. Um, and just think more about the environment, even more so than, than what you're teaching or, or preaching. Um, and that's definitely important as a leader. That's really good advice. Surround yourself. That's, that's key. Super key. So that's an amazing reminder to all of us. And, you know, when I look at how successful you are, it's, it's incredible. And I also think as we look for what's next from concierge, I'm excited to see, you're probably going to tell me what you're working on and then, and then you're going to achieve 10 more things. It's, it's always superseding my expectations, but, um, you know, maybe just leave us with a couple thoughts on what's next for concierge. Hmm. What's next for us? Well, I mentioned the, the geographic growth for us. And so that's something that I'm really working on right now is how to continue to, to build and, um, 
you know, give more support to our international teams. And they've proven to really be successful. This in the past week, we sold five properties in Europe. So that, as an example, that team um, and differentiators for us um, in the marketplace in how we service clients at the highest level. So those are things that are really top of mind for me right now. And there are a lot of different, you know, uh, projects that go into both of those buckets: um, client experience and growth. And that's what I'm most focused on. Great. Great. Any other parting thoughts before we, uh, and we have a couple more minutes. I, I, I didn't know if you had any closing remarks. Well, I'll just say thank you to you. I'm so impressed by you too. You keep to tossing that at me, but relevance has grown so much. And I've just been really, it's been my pleasure to be working with y'all and watch the success that you've had. Um, so we've kind of been going at this together for the past however many years, lots of years. <laughs> no. Thank you. Well, congrats. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much. It's really been fun to catch up. And um, yeah, this is going to be great. And uh, for anybody who wants to reach out with more questions, feel free to ping us on relevancereport.com. You can reach out to us there. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.